WB. Restore the Snyderverse. Back in 2017, the first video review I ever uploaded was for the theatrical cut of Justice League. I gave it a 7 out of 10, or it would now be 3.5 stars in my new review system. Well, let's just say over time it got worse, and now after the real version, I'll just quote my main man, Ray Fisher, and say that I'd like to forcefully retract the entire video. And how cool is it that the real Justice League brings me back to doing video reviews? If you're not familiar with Zack Snyder's Justice League, otherwise known as the Snyder Cut, have you even been on the internet in the last few years? This has been covered extensively elsewhere, but in short, the director, Zack Snyder, famously butted heads with Warner Brothers after the divisive reception of Batman v Superman. They continually interfered in shooting Justice League, making Snyder compromise a ton, and then very tragically, his daughter Autumn took her own life. The Snyder stepped away from the production, and sometime during all of this, Joss Whedon, who was the director of the Avengers and Avengers Age of Ultron and Firefly, many good properties, was brought on to write some additional material. Well, when Snyder stepped down, he was given reign as the new director, Joss Whedon was, to complete the film and was mandated to make it under two hours. He wrote 80 pages of new material, equaling about an hour of new footage, and altered pretty much all of what Snyder had originally shot. And Snyder had shot over five hours of footage, which was then edited down into the four hour and two minute movie we have now, five of those minutes being the reshoots he did this past October. So when people say that this is a new movie, truly it is. It may have the same overall premise and plot as the theatrical cut, but the context and journey are wildly different, night and day. And what we get is better in pretty much every imaginable way. This is one of those reviews where comparisons to the theatrical cut are going to come in and out because let's just be honest, we kind of have to with the situation, but I'll say this first. I can enjoy the theatrical cut and even some of the added weed material, but not at the cost of losing this incredible piece of filmmaking and all the context that comes with it because creative vision is important. So let's begin and break it down by character. Spoiler warning from here on out, Batman. Man, I love Affleck as Bruce Wayne and Batman. He might even be my favorite. Not willing to commit there, but his art from BVS continues beautifully here. The change that we saw occur in the wonderfully misunderstood and overly hated on Martha moment and Superman's sacrifice inspiring him to be better than he ever was is on full display. He mentions he's operating on faith alone this time when usually Batman is incredibly calculated and cold. So this is a nice character growth from what we saw in BVS. This Bruce has seen a thing or two, but is still warm and full of compassion since he's been inspired desperately pleading to put the team together to become something more than what they already are to save the world. And he succeeds. But in the theatrical cut, he's all over the place. One minute, he's this nice guy. Then the next, he's a jerk to the team, barking insults and orders to the point where Wonder Woman hits him. And then he cracks random jokes. For example, when he drops the team off in Russia in the theatrical, he just barks orders and then leaves to open the portal and whatnot and jokes about Aquaman using a pitchfork. In the Snyder Cut, he warmly tells the team, this is why I brought you together, before smiling and attempting to sacrifice himself so they can finish the mission. And then the team comes to save him because they care. It feels earned. And that's the primary differences between the two films. I was happy to see Affleck's performance properly restored here. Aside from one scene, where I felt like he phoned it in at the very end of the film with Martian Manhunter. He looked noticeably different due to it being reshoots, just a little bit thinner, can't blame him. But he just came off a bit uninterested here despite the scene being pretty cool. And unfortunate that we didn't get Green Lantern John Stewart like it was planned, but I did love who we did see and that is Martian Manhunter. It's just unfortunate that Affleck came off like he was asleep five minutes before. Martian Manhunter is such a fun addition, confirming fan theories forever that he was General Swanwick. That adds an interesting dimension to his scenes in previous films when you go back. Pretty cool. I like his design and the CGI is fine, if not great. It's like that in some other areas too. Never outright bad. And some take issue with the fact that he's been absent from pretty major battles, but that's the point. Martian Manhunter felt alone, that he would be rejected and couldn't truly make a difference. Superman and the Justice League inspire him to correct that thinking, realizing he has a stake in the world. 
Plus, it's not like he hasn't been affecting change as a top military official this whole time. His scene as Martha was such a cool reveal, as his relationship with Lois in previous films makes this feel earned, just like we talked about earlier. He knows the good she can do. The only caveat here is that it makes some upset that Martha wasn't actually there to visit Lois, like she does in the theatrical cut. But Lois calls her later in the film when Superman comes back, and I love how it just showcases Swanwick's or Martian Manhunter and Lois's relationship. I love that Lois gets so many quiet, reflective moments. She's grieving throughout, and it's much more effective than how it presents her daily routine and how this puts her at the incident when Superman comes back. It's much more earned, like we talked about earlier. And honestly, the fact that her arc was entirely changed from questioning everything she was doing because of her grief and abandoning her passion to her just writing some columns in the theatrical cut, this is much better. In fact, what they did was mind-bogglingly weird. But here, she's empowered and finds her drive again, able to overcome her grief for the good of the change she, she can affect, and for herself. And the biggest thing, she's pregnant. The test in the drawer was really the only indication we needed, can it be more obvious? But at the end, there's a smaller one. Bruce tells Clark congrats, which could have been about their engagement that Clark basically confirmed when he comes back. But we see Lois carrying a cradle or a bassinet, something like that. In the theatrical cut, it's just a box. Why would they change this? Wonder Woman is still pretty much herself through this, being absolutely savage in action sequences and heartwarming in quieter moments, such as with Alfred, which I adored. Especially him lecturing a 5,000 year old woman on how to make tea. Brilliant. I will admit, in the theatrical cut, I dug some of her additional material about stepping up the lead, uh, Batman calling her out for walking away from humanity, and some tender moments with Batman later on because of this. However, they all felt a bit forced and misplaced when she had overcome that arc when she steps up in BVS. That was the whole point. This is a much more organic evolution of her character, especially that she steps up to take charge whenever she needs to throughout the film and it's not this big deal, she just does it. And she's able to speak to Cyborg and convince him to come help the team from experience. It works quite well. Also, I love that she was not just gonna let Steppenwolf walk away after what he did at the Amazons, or get punched away, maybe I should say. Also, why would they cut out her speech to, that inspires a little girl? It was wonderful and heartwarming. Cyborg absolutely gains the most from the additional runtime. Snyder has said he has always been the heart of the film, and that's absolutely true cannot be stated enough. His journey from college football superstar who sees affection from his father to a half man, broken half man, to a restored hero is a Superman arc of his own, accepting his destiny and godlike power and using it to be a force for good. This is shown well when he gives that woman money and after he sees her whole life, it showcases well what he can do with his powers. He even gets his own first flight scene. Without Cyborg, they wouldn't have been able to win. I've heard complaints that he should have had a solo movie first, and I disagree since he's so intrinsically and extrinsically, extrinsically tied to the mother boxes. That scene where he scores the touchdown and celebrates in front of the crowd with that swelling score almost feels allegorical to the victory that Ray Fisher has with this cut. His performance was great and he deserves every bit of attention that he can get after what he's endured behind the scenes. Cyborg's father, Silas, gets much more of an arc and is a more sympathetic character, making the ultimate sacrifice and connecting the plot nicely to Star Labs activities. I thought the guy who played Ryan Choi was having a blast, obviously, but it felt like his dialogue came off a bit forced. It's a shame we won't see his film unless something changes at WB, but what's really apparent is how many people of color were taken out of this movie or had drastically reduced roles. Ryan Choi, Silas Stone, Cyborg, pretty much all the extra Amazonian warriors, Cyborg's mom, and then we find out we lost Jon Stewart. I don't understand it when you have such a beautiful and diverse cast making up this epic. Why would you do that? Aquaman's role is mostly the same, but he also has much more setup for a solo film. He's far more concerned with right and wrong than he was before, and he definitely cares. We see more of Mera and Volko finally actually explaining where he got his armor and his mom's trident from. Even though in BVS he has it in the footage Wonder Woman watches, Maybe he was training with Volko still at the time? Unfortunately, either due to the theatrical cut or Juan needing to make some changes, James Wan, there are a few continuity errors with this solo film. Mara has a British accent, which, whatever, 
Wanda's comes and goes in the MCU too. Mera also mentions her parents being dead, but her dad is in Aquaman. So she's either adopted there or she was being metaphorical about him being dead to her, or it's just an issue. Up to you. I'll take a combination of the first two, maybe. So I don't know. Aquaman's still cool as mess, gets more action moments to shine, and he's still funny. I loved his bromance moments with Barry especially. They legitimately cracked me up. The scene where Volko first shows up, Aquaman is not at the literal place of Atlan and his trident. It's just a statue and a re replica meant to honor him, I assume. I don't know why some think it's the legit thing, but I want to point this out as it's stone. stone. The Flash is the one who probably needs a solo movie first to really grasp his character. Ezra Miller plays Barry Allen as a mix between Peter Parker, Spider-Man, and Wally West, the other Flash. But he still has many Barry qualities too, and it worked for me. And it doesn't really bother me since I know the source material better than most people, admittedly. But for those that don't, it's a lot to take in and assume. And I think there's a mention in the theatrical cut, but there's no mention of how he got his powers in this cut, unless I'm wrong. Please correct me if I am. The use of slow motion in this movie is excessive, but also gorgeous. And it fits Flash's powers well and showing super speed and to slow things down how he sees it. And when I say power, I mean it. The speed force has never felt like more of a force of cosmic nature. Barry also gets a moment showcasing his intellect, heart, and humor. I left many, I laughed many times at him, and even some of Whedon's jokes in the theatrical, really only the Pet Cemetery and the reaction to the Batmobile were good. But the fact that they needed to add falling on Wonder Woman's chest in the original cut is so insulting and childish. But I digress. Oh, and the reversal of time sequence makes the stakes feel so much higher and literally takes breaking space time to be able to save our heroes. Even Superman. You see him get all disintegrated. Superman. Also, hot dogs. If you know, you know. Just kidding. That song was also stuck in my head for days. Man, this score. Tom Holkenborg, otherwise known as Junkie XL, has absolutely outdone himself here. I was worried he'd be stuck in the shadow of Hans Zimmer um, with his previous works, but he absolutely nailed the epic mythological underpinnings of the League while giving us character-driven themes and tunes that you can hum which a lot of movies don't give you nowadays. Hearing this modernized Superman theme come back was just, oh my gosh, I, I teared up. Both times I watched it, and when I hear that incredible tune that Zimmer created, recreated here with bombastic epic effect, I cannot help but smile. And finally, to my favorite character, my favorite superhero, Superman. I'm going to get this out of the way and say that Whedon wrote some decent Superman material. A little too corny overall, but it seems with the Flash I actually miss in some of his interaction with other members of the League, because he doesn't really have that here, which is very unfortunate. But it's never going to be at the cost of that horrifying CGI lip. I'll take this over that any day. Because here, it's solely about his return. He's built up to throughout the entire movie, as his presence or lack of thereof is always felt. When he returns, we see him have hope again. He died for the world he loved, for the woman he loved, despite being hated, and sees the monument built up to him, and that he's needed by the League, that he's wanted by Lois and his mom, and that he has been given a second chance, and he says he's not gonna waste it. Then, when he has every right to rest in the arms of the women he loves, he tells them that he was brought back here for a reason, mirroring how his fathers both said he was sent here for a reason, and it's his duty to find out why. We get a fantastic first flight scene redone in the gorgeous black suit that I think is supposed to be both practical to absorb more sunlight and it also seems ceremonial based on what we saw in, with Zod and Man of Steel and some of the Kryptonian culture. I wish we had had a little bit more context, but it works for me overall because I love the black suit. And as I mentioned, when that theme kicks off, it's hard not to smile as you hear Jonathan Kent and Jor-El speaking in Superman's mind. Does he lay down? The Smackdown on Steppenwolf, good grief. How cool was his entrance, reminding me of Goku from DBZ. I geeked out really hard, as you can tell, and ironically, I think he beat Steppenwolf even faster in this cut. I was sad there wasn't more Superman, but what we got was perfect, even if I would have liked to see more additional interaction with the League, and how they explain his return as Clark Kent when Clark Kent also died, in that final wonderful poignant voiceover. Cavill, Henry Cavill, 
is so earnest in this role, playing Superman with heart and ferocity. He's one of my favorite Superman by far. So while I wanted more, and this is probably one of the more disappointing things, I still absolutely love what we got. Since I'm thinking about it, Deathstroke being back was awesome, but also heartbreaking since we now see the setup for the Batman um, Affleck solo movie. And a jarring transition aside, the nightmare future scene was pretty thrilling. I am so happy we got to see a completely world weary and desperate killing Batman chew up the scene with Jared Leto's Joker. It's just unfortunate how obvious it was and how it was shot due to COVID-19, how neither actor was on set with the other. It's, it's all done in close-ups. But it's still cool here, and it's a nice use of shallow depth of field in those close-ups. It really adds to it being like a dreamlike future sequence or whatnot, and uncertainty for Joker's character and mindset. And it makes me want to see the sequel so much more, knowing Snyder's plan now. And to step in love. First off, his redesign is so much better this go-round. He looks like a new god from Apocalypse, ripped straight from the comics. Not some generic CGI alien statue looking weird chin head face. And no, there's no upward angle shot where you see his butt this time around. Dubbed on the internet as Steppin' Butt. He actually feels like a character here with a somewhat tragic backstory that tells you he will stop at nothing to redeem his name and return home. Something that's even compelling for a scary alien genocidal monster maniac. We should have gotten a tad bit more on what he did to betray Darkseid specifically, but I guess it can be inferred enough through dialogue that he attempted to challenge Darkseid for the throne, betraying him, he was exiled, he killed all these uh, people that were also threatening the throne. Um, and in the comics, Steppenwolf was Darkseid's uncle. I'm not sure about here. But that line, I slaughtered all who opposed your throne, seems to indicate that he did in fact attempt to atone earlier on, but Darkseid gave a, uh, a heavier punishment demanding 150,000 worlds to be conquered in his name. A little bit excessive, honestly. <laughs> but every time Steppenwolf is on screen, he's intimidating, he's captivating, and he's a force of nature in every fight scene. Some may disagree with me, but I thought he was pretty freaking cool. And he was fantastically voiced with some obvious modifications by Ciarian Hines. Ciarian Hines? I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but he was great. I loved him. Some argue, why well, have a lesser known villain be the character in the first movie? I argue with the MCU, they had Loki, who had been in another film, I know. A great but smaller time villain, and they worked their way up to Thanos. He was even teased at the end. Same deal here, except we actually get a few scenes with Darkseid that were all in the trailers. Darkseid is one of my favorite DC villains, and he's such a cool presence. Properly built up to, and no, it's not at all an issue. We see him get defeated, 5,000 years ago before he took the throne and thereby the full power of the dark side entity when it took three Olympian deities, a Green Lantern, and the armies of men and Amazons to stop him. And Atlanteans. What doesn't make sense and is my biggest issue with the film is how in the world he loses the location of Earth when he found anti-life there in the original war. If he lost the mother boxes when they went to sleep, then they first called the Steppenwolf and apparently only to Steppenwolf, since Luther happened to be talking to him in the scout ship at the exact time Superman died, and Steppenwolf finds a primitive world with lost mother boxes, how did Steppenwolf not know this was the lost world? That must mean there are lots of mother boxes, which is within reason due to the comics, but also other lost mother boxes, lost by other entities trying to conquer as well? And if Steppenwolf has conquered so many worlds, does he not do it with the unity of the mother boxes? I guess not, since he's banished and therefore wants to use the mother boxes to better appease Darkseid. Even Dasad isn't surprised there's some random planet with lost mother boxes. But when they awoke and knew that it was the planet with anti-life on it, why didn't they summon Darkseid directly? Even if Lexa was talking to Steppenwolf, it doesn't make much sense. And even further, how does a fourth dimensional alien race lose the location of a planet with the most powerful weapon in the universe, which is only partially explained, the anti-life equation, but it's too convoluted for the first film in my opinion, what they say is fine and could have been explained in more in depth later when it comes back into play. Wait, we're getting sequels. Why did the mother box even need to show Steppenwolf this? Why not tell Dasad the moment Steppenwolf shows up with the first box? Snyder has said Darkseid lost the location due to being nearly killed in the political situation on Apocalypse. But 
this isn't really in the film. It's vaguely hinted at throughout a couple different moments of dialogue. But it's also suggested that when the mother boxes went dark, they became anonymous among a trillion worlds. And Artemis nearly blows up his ship, so I guess they could have destroyed the navigational system, but they're still a bit leave. It's barely passable. But as you can tell, it doesn't really hold up to scrutiny and is the one glaring plot hole that can have some halfway decent explanations based on inferring. But it's unfortunate the two lines could have shown us. Heck, even one line, a voiceover, could have solved the issue in an already four hour film with an extensive voiceover scene. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about how pitch perfect Snyder's direction is. The color palette, cinematography, score, writing, character work, humor, and the action sequences. Mm -hmm. They are given so much more off. And it all works together to give Justice League the feel it needed. The feel of an epic, of epic mythology. This is one of the greatest superhero films ever made. And quite potentially the capper to the greatest superhero trilogy of all time. Zack Snyder's Justice League is a full on five out of five star experience for me. We deserve the sequels. WB needs to listen to the fans again. We want it and we will pay for it. You released the Snyder Cut, now restore the Snyderverse. Hey, also if you wanna uh, subscribe while you're at it, I'm gonna be doing more of these, so appreciate it.